This is the vampire deer, except it doesn't drink blood and it can see its own reflection and it can't turn into a bat and it doesn't really have anything to do with vampires. Let's start over. This is the Chinese water deer, and as you can see, it has adorable, large canine teeth jutting down from its face. Now, it doesn't use those jaws to fight, but it does use those fangs to uh, intimidate and puncture other males that it's trying to mm, rival its way with. And what's cool about the teeth on these water deer is that they are uh, kind of movable, like vampire teeth, in that they are loose in the sockets and controllable via the deer's facial muscles, so they can and flick them forward when they want to attack and then retract them when they want to eat. I guess you could say that looks can be deceiving. Yes! And welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections and address them in an increasingly unhinged manner with Bo Staff. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, but getting right down to it, we're trying to figure out in the last episode of Because Science just how much energy is in Gambit's famous playing card when he charges it. Canonically, there is as much energy inside one of his glowing purple playing cards as a, a hand grenade, which is quite a lot. Now, what we calculated using the chemical potential energy and gravitational potential energy of a typical playing card, we found that it doesn't quite come close to hand grenade levels of energy for Gambit's cards, but it's still quite a bit, although uh, Remy old Remy boy could increase the amount of energy per card if he made his cards out of something else, like uranium. But what did you have to say? What did you have to say? Cane me! So, getting right to it, ooh, what's the first comment that we got? Ah! A lot of people were saying last week that when I was playing with props, I was basically losing my mind, and that, what, 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 what's that? I'm just, Talking to myself? Our first comment comes from Noah Nault, who says, Gambit also threw a can of beans in an all-new Wolverine comic, and it blew up the side of a helicarrier. All right, so I think we're working with potential energy here again, so let's just do a quick bean calculation. <laughs> so, uh, if you look up the average caloric content of some uh, amount of bean, and then you multiply that by how much bean is in one can of bean, then you get six megajoules? Six million joules, which is roughly 10 hand grenades. So if Gambit threw a can of bean at the side of a ship, it would do some serious damage. He should throw food. If Gambit threw Doritos, just with the chemical potential energy in Doritos, sweet Doritos, it'd, it'd pack a punch. A tasty punch. The band-aid I'm wearing is unrelated to this. Our next comment comes from Jacob Argo and Lights on Tree 00 and others who are saying, well, what if we interpret Gambit's powers to be like direct matter to energy conversion? There's even a version of Gambit called New Sun where his uh, powers are in effect supercharged and he can turn matter directly into energy. Then what would Gambi be working with? Well, just like we did for the can o bean calculation, what would the direct matter to energy value for a typical playing card be? Well, the most amount of energy you can get out of matter is from matter itself. So what if Gambit's powers could apply an equivalent amount of antimatter to the matter of a typical playing card? And if you do that, I used 1.8 grams for a typical playing card. If you do that, multiply that by the speed of light squared, you get mm, 10 times more energy than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in a single playing card. Like I said in the episode, the greatest source of energy, if you can harness it, is from mass itself. And you can see just from a gram, a single gram of a playing card, you can get a ludicrous amount of energy. So if that's what the more supercharged versions of Gambit were using, then yeah, that would be the bomb. 
Our next comment comes from Zachariah Deerling and Mega Magic Monkey, who say, and others, who say something about, well, what about the ink printed on those cards? Wouldn't that have some effect on the energy that Gambit was working with for each playing card? Now, in my calculations, I did not include the ink at all because mass-wise, which is where you'd be getting the energy from, mass-wise, it's, I'm considering, an insignificant amount of mass in proportion to the rest of the card. So, you know, if it's, if it's less than 1% the mass of the card, Card, the ink is, then I don't think it's going to be adding all that much, even if it has a very high chemical potential energy, higher than wood or polystyrene or coal, like we said in the episode. So I didn't actually consider the ink at all. And there's a lot of internet stories floating around about people using card ink to do stuff that's explosive, but I couldn't really find the definitive source um, on any of those. So we're not considering ink for Gambit. But if he wanted to spice things up, could he include something like uranium powder in the ink or something like that? Sure, but you still have the mass problem. The majority of it is in the card itself, so you'd want to make a playing card out of the material rather than just mm, a spicing it up with some ink. <laughs> Our next comment comes from frequent commenter Ryan Alexander Bloom, who's talking about all the different things we can make a card out of, uh, specifically the materials that I didn't consider because it would be very hard to make a card out of them, like hydrogen gas. He goes on to say, you could have 20% more energy than in coal, what we said in the episode, if you use cards made out of fat. If you somehow fashioned animal fat into cards, you would get more potential chemical energy out of them. But I didn't use that because you're throwing around lard slices, <laughs> which A, sounds gross, B, probably won't fly too well, C, sounds gross, and B, ew. Quick, Gambit, there's a Sentinel. Do something about it. Sure. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving again to Warland Writer, who says a lot of stuff, but eventually uh, does some calculations to say that, well, what if we're considering the actual kinetic energy of a playing card? I calculate that you could get uh, a pressure in the hundreds of thousands of pascals of pressure, and that would get close to doing some real damage or at least cutting your skin. I'm giving you the super nerd of the week again, Warland Writer, because I did the exact same calculations when I started my research for this episode. The writers for Gambit interpreted kinetic energy as a kind of explosive thing, which is not the most common interpretation of what kinetic energy is. So when I started the research, I said, okay, well, what if he can turn potential energy directly into kinetic energy because the card will go so dang fast all of a sudden? And with uh, my calculations, just like your calculations with crumple zones and stuff, I figured that using the edge of a playing card at that edge, if Gambit hit you with it just from kinetic energy from velocity alone, it could impart maybe 100 gigapascals on your body, just along that thin edge of a playing card. Now, 100 gigapascals is about one-third the pressure at the center of the Earth. And if Gambit was throwing cards like that, they could go through just about any material or any normal material. Uh, and I think they'd even be more dangerous than a hand grenade if he was doing that. But hey, the comics don't interpret it that way, so I guess we can. Wait, what's that? Oh. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah, Warland Rider, you are indeed a three time super nerd. But of course, I'm not always right. I almost decked myself in a game of Magic the Gathering playing Commander with the Locust God, where I couldn't interrupt uh, my own infinite loop with Kindred Discovery on the draw trigger from the Locust God creating an insect token. <laughs> I ended up cyclonic rifting my own Kindred Discovery to stop the infinite loop, but <laughs> I almost. Woo! I still won though. So what did I get wrong last week? That doesn't follow. Who cares? Our first correction comes from Joey McBride who says, I think you should also take into consideration the speed of his throw. If he's throwing playing cards like professional magicians, they have been clocked in at around 90 miles per hour, so it might add some energy to it. Well, all right, Joey, let's do some more calculating. If you take the mass of a typical playing card, uh, I said 1.8 grams again, and you take 90 miles per hour, you can apply that to the kinetic energy equation, which is 1 half mv squared. So half of 1.8 grams times 90 miles per hour squared. And if you do that, you get a grand total of about one. 
one jewel. Considering that we are dealing with tens of thousands of jewels in the episode per our assumptions, this would add less than 1% to the total, which is why I did not consider kinetic energy. Uh, if you wanted to have kinetic energy really come into play, Gambit would have to throw the cards a lot, a lot faster, or they'd have to be a lot heavier. You're, you're on the right track that there is some energy to be had there, but in terms of the total energy, it is almost insignificant. Our next correction comes from frequent commenter Hosimina, who says, uh, you missed a detail or two. There are other materials with higher specific heats than uh, polystyrene as you used it. They can make, uh, Gamma can make the cards out of something else. Okay, well, there's one correction to your correction. If you're using specific heat, that is how much energy uh, per unit mass per Kelvin it takes to heat up some material. That's not how much chemical potential energy it has inside that material. But I found a list of chemical potential energies for the materials that you were mentioning, like vinyl, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, and you are right, there is a slight increase in the energy you can get versus something like polystyrene or coal, like I mentioned, but it's not like an order of magnitude difference. It's a few times, like five to seven times. So while you you are correct, I don't think it changes our conclusions all that much. And make sure you are using specific energy and not specific heat. Those are two very different things. Our next correction comes from Ninja Bear Films, frequent commenter, who says, I believe it's canonical that Remy can charge much more deadly objects, but chooses playing cards to regulate the destructive power that he has in potential. It's not like he'd want to be uh, within a throwing distance of a uranium playing card or using such a thing when fighting off sentinels and when he's trying to apprehend teen mutants in the local shopping mall. Just think of the collateral damage he would impart. It would destroy cities and millions of innocent humans and mutants alike. I know, I totally agree with you. A uranium playing card would be the uh, most destructive according to our assumptions, but if you couldn't control something like that, if you didn't have power over it, then, you know, what would you want to even use it for? Our next correction comes from a few people who take issue with the fact that I said that a cup of hot water is slightly more massive than the same cup of cold water because of mass energy equivalence. Something with more energy has a little bit more mass than the identical object. So let me be uh, much more clear. Now, if you were to heat up cold water, the water would expand and get less dense. So if you're not taking into consideration the volume, because hot water is less dense, it could weigh less than cold water. And in most instances uh, for normal, practical, everyday life, it is. But I am talking about a purely physics perspective. If you took some water in a closed, sealed container and you measured its weight, its mass and weight, in a vacuum, you would find that hot water, because it has more energy in the movement of its particles, even though all those particles are exactly the same as all the particles in the cold water, the hot water would weigh slightly, slightly more because of mass energy equivalence. And that's true, though the effect is very small, maybe a few nanograms of extra mass for every kilogram of water that you heat up. But it is still nonetheless true. It is weird and uh, normal everyday effects like increased uh, density and stuff will kind of swamp out these small relativistic effects, but they're still there because But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode I'm giving to another one-time super nerd, Donnie Morrow, who goes through a bunch of different materials to try to find an even better one than I used in the episode, and they say I've settled on polyethylene. It's flexible, dense, easily customizable for material properties. It burns efficiently, and it's tied for the cheapest of these options with polypropylene. I can say words. Where I work, we manufacture a high-density, flexible polyethylene that can be easily turned into playing cards for less than $1 per deck. At a deck volume of 92.9 milliliters, specific energy of 46.3 megajoules per kilogram, and a density of 0.965 grams per milliliter, that brings this deck of cards to 4.2 megajoules, or 76.9 kilojoules per card. Not a bad trade-off for extra authenticity. I'm giving you the Super Nerd of the Week this week, again, Mr. Morrow, because I like to think of you now as like Gambit's deck guy. You know what, uh, Mr. LeBeau, uh, yeah, I mean, if I see what you're using there, and if we made those out of polyethylene, I, I figure we can make those for less than $1 per deck. And then Gambit's like, Cajun accent, that sounds good.
So for adding another layer to our head cannon, that Gambit has a card guy that manufactures uh, polyethylene cards at the cheapest price. You are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Too much. Now, if you're already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be, because you saw it, this guy, two days earlier before anyone else, and other premium content for myself, Nerdist, Inky, and Sundry. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is... <clears throat> How to Hear a Scream in Space. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we're looking at arguably the most famous movie tagline in all of human history, in space, no one can hear you scream. Is that always true? Is there really no place in space that someone could hear you about to be face-hugged? We figure it out, and the results may whelm you. Not under or over, just whelmed. So, go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about gambits, cards, and sweet bow staffs. And leave me all your best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. I'm pretty sure I did this right. And look out on this channel on Thursday because we have a very special announcement that all you super nerds are going to be very interested in. I promise. It, it's really cool. It's, we did a big thing. I can't wait. And don't forget, 